The second impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump began this week. We've already heard arguments by House impeachment managers, and today we'll hear from President Trump's legal defense. Here to discuss is Senator Ted Cruz, the author of One Vote Away. Senator, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Now, before we get into what we've heard so far, what are we expecting to hear from Trump's legal team today? Well, the argument will begin at noon today, and I, and I expect they will argue about four hours. Um, they're going to take substantially less time than the House managers did. Both sides were given 16 hours total to argue. Uh, the House managers took, I think, about 12 of those hours. I think the, the Trump legal team will take about four. Um, if you look at what the House managers did, they spent virtually all of their time uh, playing videos, really powerful, emotional videos, uh, recounting what happened on January 6th and, and, and making the case that January 6th was, was a horrific terrorist attack on the Capitol, that it was despicable. And, and I got to say, all 100 senators, we were here, we lived through it. And, and every one of us agrees that every one of the violent criminals who carried out that attack should be fully prosecuted and should go to jail for a very, very long time. Um, I think much of the House manager's case was proving a point everyone agreed. With. The legal question before the Senate, however, is, is, is a much more specific question, which is, did President Trump commit high crimes or misdemeanors, the constitutional standards for impeachment? There is only one count that is alleged in the articles of impeachment, and that is incitement. And it was fairly striking that in the 16 hours of argument the House managers had allocated, they devoted a total of 15 minutes to making the argument that President Trump had met uh, the threshold, met the standard for incitement. I expect President Trump's defense lawyers to focus very directly on that point and to make the case, yes, what happened on the 6th was horrible. It was criminal conduct. It was violent and murderous and needs to be fully prosecuted. But what President Trump did, the standard put forth by the Democrats uh, is not the standard for incitement. And under any reasonable measure, President Trump's conduct, the speech he gave on the 6th, doesn't qualify as incitement. And the standard the Democrats have put forward would equally condemn dozens of statements and speeches and intemperate rhetoric from multiple Democrats. And, and so it's an, there's no coherent standard that has been put forth by the House Democratic managers that would somehow uh, convict President Trump and exonerate the Democrats on both sides of the aisle, there has been intemperate and overheated rhetoric, but in neither case, I believe, has it been incitement. And, and that's going to be the result at the end of the day, which is that President Trump is going to be acquitted. President Biden said Thursday that some minds may have changed after seeing those videos, those uh, previously unseen footage of the Capitol riot. Have you talked to any Republicans who are sort of on the fence with whether or not they'll vote to convict? Has any Have any minds been changed essentially since that footage uh, was, was uh, seen on Wednesday? You know, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, listen, I will commend the, the, the Democrat House members and that they're talented trial lawyers. And then there's always been a lot of good trial lawyers, in the Democratic Party, and they're good storytellers. And, and they also have the advantage of Hollywood in their side. And so the videos they showed were put together very well. Mm -hmm. And they were powerful. I mean, it was emotional sitting on, uh, on the Senate floor. Uh, I mean, you could hear a pin drop. It was we were reliving a terrorist attack that every one of us had experienced firsthand. That being said, um, I think a lot of the Republican senators were actually quite disturbed by the hypocrisy of the Democratic managers because they were pretending like they were purer than driven snow. And so, for example, Democratic House managers put a lot of emphasis on the fact that, that President Trump in his January 6th speech said, we need to fight, we need to fight like hell. Well, look, if saying we need to fight or fight like hell, if that qualifies as incitement, then without exaggeration, every political candidate in America is guilty of incitement because there is not a senator in that chamber. All 100 of us, any, any candidate who has stood on the stump and given a speech has said we need to fight. If you ran for student council in seventh grade, I'm willing to bet you stood up and said we need to fight for something. That, that is ubiquitous in American political discourse and rhetoric. And so the House managers, I think for most of the Republicans, they looked at it and thought, okay, this is, 
this is hypocritical. This is a double standard. Th what this is about is that you hate Donald Trump. And we get you hate Donald Trump. The Democrats, if they've made one thing clear for the last four years, it is that they utterly loathe and detest Donald Trump. That doesn't mean his conduct constitutes a high crime or misdemeanor. And so you ask, has anyone's mind been changed? The answer is no. The president is going to be acquitted. In order to convict, it takes 67 votes. There is a 0% chance that that happens. I think we will probably end up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 votes to convict. All 50 Democrats will vote to convict. I think likely you'll see five Republicans vote to convict. I'd say plus or minus two votes. It could be as low as 53. It could be as high as 57. But it's nowhere close to 67. And so the end of this, every senator knows, the House manager knows, every reporter knows the end of this is going to be that the president will be acquitted. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has talked about, you know, moving forward to actually uh, censure Donald Trump. What's required to do that? And, you know, how could this impact his, uh, you know, chance to run again in the future? Well, I, I don't think the, the Senate is going to censure him. I fully expect uh, Democrats to try to do that. I think there's a pretty widespread sentiment among Republicans. Look, you choose the path you're on. If you want to go down the path of censure, we could have debated that and considered it. But you didn't. You went down the, 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 the path of impeachment instead. And I think most Republicans agree you shouldn't get two bites at the apple. You don't get to keep coming back over and over and over again. Um, you brought an impeachment and it failed or it's going to fail. Um, in terms of the president's ability to run again, um, I think as a legal matter, as a constitutional matter, the president will be able to run again. And, and, and by the way, that's as it should be. Y you know, there's a rich irony and that you've got a bunch of Democrats puffing out their chest and saying, we are defending democracy. And then you listen to their arguments as to why they say they're defending democracy. And they say, well, if the Senate doesn't convict and disqualify Donald Trump from running for office, the damn voters might vote for him again. Now, listen, I understand from their perspective, Donald Trump being elected president is a really bad thing. I get that from their partisan political perspective. But if you are arguing that we have got to do extraordinary things to prevent the voters from voting for someone you don't like, you don't get to claim you're defending democracy. That is the exact opposite of democracy. What the Democrats are trying to do is disenfranchise half the country. Um, look, personally, I don't believe Donald Trump will run again, um, but that'll be a decision for him to make. And, and I don't think it should be the Senate uh, trying to take away his ability to make that choice or try to, trying to take away the voters' ability to make the choice who they want to vote for. Well, as you just pointed out, it's pretty obvious that, you know, Senate Democrats would not want President Trump to vote or, to, excuse me, to run again. Do you think there's any Senate Republicans that would vote to convict him solely on the basis that they would not want him to run again in the future? I, you know, I don't know. Um, in terms of the, the five Senate Republicans who are likely to vote to convict, we had an early vote on a procedural motion about whether a former president can be impeached. And I think that early vote was really foreshadowing for where the final vote would be. On that early vote, there were a total of, of, of five Republicans that voted uh, against the president. They were Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, Ben Sass, and Pat Toon. Uh, I think it's a pretty good guess that those five will also vote to convict. I don't think it's 100%. One or two of them could change their mind. Um, I don't think for them it's predominantly electoral considerations that's driving them. I do think they genuinely in good faith are dismayed by things that, that President Trump has said and done. And, and look, to be clear, I, I have said many times that I think President Trump's rhetoric at times is overheated, and I wish he didn't say and tweet everything he says and tweets. I, I can't control that. Um, my vote in, in this proceeding is not whether I agree with every tweet he's ever sent. My vote in this proceeding is whether the House managers have carried their burden of proof of demonstrating that the president committed a high crime or misdemeanor. And that vote is easy because the answer is no, they haven't come remotely close to it. Um, and, and I think that's going to be, be, be the judgment of the vast majority of Senate Republicans. I just want to ask you about a recent Fox News op-ed that you uh, 
wrote, you, you write that I believe that the better constitutional argument is that a former president can be impeached and tried. That is that the Senate has jurisdiction to hold a trial. However, nothing in the, in the text of the constitution requires the Senate to choose to exercise jurisdiction. Can you expand on what you mean by that? Sure, and, and this is a complicated legal question. As you noted, I wrote, a, wrote an op-ed to try to walk people through it. I also, uh, on my podcast, Verdict with Ted Cruz, I have an entire podcast where we walk through at great length the details of this because it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. The question of whether a former office holder can be impeached or tried is a close constitutional question. If you look at the text of the Constitution, there are provisions that you can argue are on both sides. Um, as I examined it and, and looked at my oath and my responsibility to uphold the Constitution, I think the better argument is, yes, a former office holder can be impeached and tried. If you look at British common law, and so a lot of times when we're interpreting the U.S. Constitution, we look at British common law that preceded it. There were multiple instances of former office holders being impeached, being tried. And in fact, at the Constitutional Convention, the framers debated one of those example, Hastings, who'd been the governor general of Indiana, who was a former office holder who at that very moment was being impeached and tried uh, in Great Britain. Uh, likewise, there, there are two instances in, in U.S. history, uh, Blunt and Belknap, uh, a senator and secretary of war who were both impeached uh, and, and the Senate debated whether they can be tried after they had left office. Uh, what I concluded on studying the merits of it is the better answer is yes, there is constitutional authority to try a, better, a former office holder, but I don't believe the jurisdiction is mandatory. So there are two types of jurisdiction, mandatory jurisdiction, which means you must take the case mm -hmm. or discretionary jurisdiction, which means you may choose whether or not to take the case. And the easiest example of this is the U.S. Supreme Court. The vast majority of the U.S. Supreme Court's docket is discretionary. About the Supreme Court gets each year about 8,000 petitions for certiorari, which are requests for the Supreme Court to take jurisdiction and hear a case. It grants typically about 80 of them, so about 1%. So 99%, it says no, grants about one. What I argued is in this instance, yes, we have jurisdiction, but our jurisdiction is discretionary and we shouldn't exercise it here because number one, what the House did, they didn't do a real impeachment. They had zero hearings. They heard no wit witnesses. They looked at no evidence. They did it in seven days. This was a political exercise of rage, not a deliberate constitutional step. And secondly, the point that we discussed a few minutes ago, which is under any standard, what they're alleging, the president's conduct doesn't meet the standard of incitement. And so there's no reason for the Senate to exercise our jurisdiction. So I voted at the outset against exercising our jurisdiction, but I wrote the op-ed to make clear, I wasn't saying we could never exercise our jurisdiction. I was saying we should not exercise our jurisdiction in these circumstances. That is very interesting. Thank you for explaining that uh, because I am obviously not a lawyer and I'm trying to keep up with all this <laughs> impeachment information. So I really appreciate you breaking that down. And of course, joining me today, I know you have a busy day ahead of you. So Senator Ted Cruz, I really appreciate it and hope you'll join me again in the future. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to it. Thank you.